Good evening. want to welcome you here tonight at 7.30. We'd like to start right on time and give Dr. Dacus her full time. Uh, we're glad to have you here. And, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Dacus, I don't know if I can apologize for the year, you know, wearing masks and social distancing and live streaming. Otherwise, we'd have a, a, a recital hall full of people uh, tonight, and I regret that Dr. Dacus does not. Uh, have that opportunity and we always have a nice reception in her honor afterwards and we're not allowed to have that uh, my secretary and I pleaded with the administration six different times since December please let us do this and uh, we'll be careful and they said we just cannot uh, take the chance right now so maybe hopefully the next time we do this next year things will have uh, gotten a lot better um, we're glad you're here tonight, and I'm going to open us with a word of prayer, but first I want to introduce Dr. Angela Willoughby. She is our long-term chair of the Department of Music, and uh, she will be retiring the end of May, unless she has accrued vacation time, which means she can leave early, but you're going to be here until May 31st, and I've got some paperwork I want to send your way, okay, <laughs> get it done. Poor. I'm just kidding. We're glad to have y'all here tonight. And Dr. Willoughby will come after the prayer and introduce Dr. Viola Dacus, okay? But she is our 20, 20 is when she was selected before we even knew Dr. Willoughby would be retiring. Um, but uh, since the performance and presentation is tonight, we are calling her our 2021. Uh, teacher award recipient for the Mississippi Humanities Council. There's a banquet later in the year if they do that. Uh, with COVID, we don't know yet, but um, it also comes with a cash award. We're very um, honored to have Dr. Dacus on our faculty here, and we are aware of her talent and skill and how much she's perfected it. I always believe that gifts are from God, but their hours to hone and improve and develop, and she's certainly done that, as you'll see tonight. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll begin. Father God, I lift up Viola Dacus to you. We thank you we can gather tonight, Lord, not only to enjoy her story and her music, but Lord, to celebrate and honor her. Lord, we know that the gifts she has are from you, the scripture says every good and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. Lord, we also thank you for hearing our prayer tonight. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 65, 24 reminds us that you said before we call you answer and while we're yet speaking, you hear. So as we mention the name of Viola Dacus to you tonight, Lord, we know it's being heard in the very throne room of heaven. Lord, thank you for blessing us tonight through her giftedness. And Lord, just be with her, fill her with your spirit. Thank you for Dr. Willoughby, Lord. And though we're sad to uh, having to say goodbye to her, we do appreciate the wonderful job she's done with the music department over the past eight years. And Lord, she will be missed around the, these halls. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for Viola's family for uh, Ed being here tonight and others, Lord. We just thank you for all of them and lift them up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Wilby. Thank you, Dr. Van Horn, for those kind words. Um, it has been my joy to be here for 22 years, um, all told. But for 20 of those years, Viola has been my colleague but before that, and long before that, she was my friend. I've known her um, since our days at LSU together, and um, I feel like I can speak with the rest of her sing with with the rest of her students in saying that she is honored and treasured at all times, not just tonight. And that only grows over the years as you think back about your uh, mentor in in your college days. It was true for us, and it will be true for our students as well. Um, Viola is a probably, I know I can say one of, if not the most versatile members of our faculty. 
She's multi-talented, and I know that's a word that gets thrown around, but it is really true of her. She's a writer, she's an actor, and she actively <laughs> pursues uh, those, act those um, um, passions, I should say. Um, we, as a music faculty, respect her for her gifts and also the way she uses them. She's extremely committed to her students. Um, I would say she's an inspired teacher and she's also an inspiration. Uh, she teaches vocal diction, um, song literature, and applied voice. Um, here at, uh, at MC, she has worked tirelessly, it, tirelessly in everything that she does. She takes it very seriously. And if you ask her to do something, it will be done um, in the best way possible with her greatest energy. She's a serious musician and a treasured colleague, and I know you will enjoy what she has to say to you tonight, and I know you will enjoy her voice. She's very well um, respected in the arts community and is much in demand for solo roles with all kinds of uh, groups. Um, she's widely known for her wonderful vocal skills. So I um, also would like to say that she's joined tonight by Mr. Tyler Kemp, who is her collaborator at the keyboard. They will perform for you, and I do hope you enjoy it. And thank you so much for being here with us, helping us to honor Dr. Viola Davis. Thank you, Dr. Willoughby and Dr. Van Horn, and thank you to the Mississippi Humanities Council for this honor and this opportunity to be with, here with you tonight. I would like to begin this evening by singing four songs by the 19th century Austrian composer Gustav Mahler. I first became aware of Mahler's music when I was in graduate school, and I quickly fell in love with his melodic gift and sensitive text setting. Mahler's music is the perfect instrument for expressing the poetry of the 18th century German poet, Friedrich Rückert, whose poems are the perfect instrument for expressing some very profound and universal human experiences. This evening's songs are largely rooted in everyday life. Tonight, my collaborator on the piano, Tyler Kemp, and I will share Rückert and Mahler's work with you. So as not to interrupt the flow of the songs, I will give you a very brief synopsis of each. The first song, Ich atmet einen Lindenduft. In this song, Rickert plays with the words Linde, meaning gentle, and Linden, meaning linden or lime tree, to express the pleasure of breathing a gentle breeze, carrying the fragrance of a blooming branch, a gift from his beloved. Mahler's music further suggests the gentle, fragrant breeze. The second song, Liebst du um Schönheit, is one of Rickert's best known and best loved poems. It states, if you love me for beauty, youth, or treasure, love me not. But if you love me for love, love me, and I will love you forever. The third song, Blicke mir nicht in die Lieder. The poet warns his loved one against premature curiosity in the poems being created, since the final result is all that matters. The second verse compares poetic creation to bees making honey an image that obviously inspired Mahler's musical setting. And finally, Ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen. This song has become a veritable anthem for singers. The subject is world weariness, and the poet Rückert accepts, even embraces the idea of being, in his own words, dead to the tumult of the world. He acknowledges the place where he can escape he exquisitely states this in the final phrases. I rest in a quiet place, my heaven, my love, my songs.
Sometimes I think I have the best job in the world. Part of my job for the past 30 plus years has been being a literal musical instrument. And doing that enables me to be a figurative instrument, to share three things I am absolutely passionate about, poetry, language, and music. But singing is only half of what I do. The other half is taking this thing that I love to do, singing, and teaching others how to do it, how they themselves can become instruments. And what I want to share with you this evening is what I have learned from them during this process, that so many of the lessons I teach in the vocal studio can be applied to life. Many of my students have actually told me this. That's a great life lesson, Dr. Dacus, or I need to remember that in everyday life, too. And the more I've thought about it, the more sense it makes. Each one of my young singers comes into my studio with a unique gift, his or her voice, just as each one of us is given the unique gift of our individual selves. Some of them have been given a dime store ukulele, others a Stradivarius, and most of them something in between. This gift of an instrument, either the voice or the life, is to be discovered, developed, and used for whatever purpose we choose, to make the most of whatever we've been given, to sing or live our best, we must proceed deliberately and thoughtfully, taking care to develop each gift without compromising its uniqueness or authenticity. I will begin in the place that I always do, with the individual voice. I want you to imagine the most extraordinary instrument one with no keys, no valves, strings, or tangible means to create sound. An instrument whose potential is completely unknown, whose shape is absolutely fluid with virtually infinite potential to change form. An instrument with no predetermined parameters of range or tone color. Imagine an instrument that, if it is not what you desire it to be, cannot be exchanged for any other. While there is nothing rare in simply having a voice, if we consider it in terms of that previously described extraordinary, non-exchangeable, keyless, shapeless instrument, it takes on new mystery. We are learning an instrument that has never been played by anyone else before. It is completely unique and initially, initially has unknown parameters a hidden instrument that must be discovered. But in spite of what might seem to be a potentially insurmountable challenge, the greatest challenge in teaching singing is not simply uncovering a hidden voice. It is guiding the student to the place where he or she can be free enough mentally and physically to do that themselves. The successes I have had helping students do that in the studio do not spring from any special technique that I was taught and hope to pass on. They spring directly from a curiosity in and a love of the human voice and indeed those human beings who possess them. For me, uncovering voices is like opening Christmas presents. This again is my job. I get to teach people how to sing. Each of us has a voice but it is up to us to determine how we will use it. And there is more to it than simply opening our mouths. This evening, I would like to address a few of the most frequently recurring issues I deal with in the studio, and perhaps you will find, as I have, how frequently terms like voice and life, singer and person, and sing and live can at sometimes feel almost interchangeable. Lesson one. Each voice is unique. It is of the utmost importance to approach each new singer with no preconceived idea of what the voice should sound like. One of my greatest joys as a teacher is exploring and freeing a voice so that what it will be is revealed to me. In early lessons, I may hear a brief presence of color that sounds uniquely authentic to that student. And although brief, there is something in that fleeting sound that is exciting and urges me to discover more. Perhaps an even greater joy is when the student experiences something startlingly new in his or her own voice, perhaps a surprising, easy, new resonance. 
I always smile remembering one young student beaming from ear to ear and literally jumping up and down in the studio saying, what was that? What was that? <laughs> that is your voice, I told her. And that is what spurs practice and development, and more importantly, a desire to discover more. Each singer's voice is a unique instrument, and it cannot be exchanged. We are each given our instrument at birth, and there is no sense in comparing to anyone else's. For young singers, this can be difficult to truly understand. It is easy to admire another singer's voice or even be envious, especially if the other singer is getting solos, roles, and a lot of attention. Additionally, singers may be aesthetically drawn to certain voice types and the music composed for them. How many sopranos have dreamed of singing voluptuous Puccini roles, but maybe were born with a light, flexible coloratura instrument, or vice versa? Maybe a singer yearns to sing Wagner, but is better suited for Handel. High notes, low notes, dark voice, crystalline tone, coloratura, belt, voluptuous lyric, the possibilities are as numerous as the variety of singers themselves. Unfortunately, what sings remarkably consistent is a near universal belief that whatever the other person has must be better. But that simply does not have to be true if you realize your own gift. Take what you've been given and run with it. As Bernadette Peters once said, you've got to be original because if you're like someone else, what do they need you for? There is no one with whom you are in competition but yourself. If I can get a singer to really embrace that idea, it simplifies things to an unbelievable degree. You only need to be the best that you can be. And by keeping your focus on that, rather than the dozens of potential distractions that don't matter anyway, you can truly do your best. That is all anyone can ever ask of you, ever. You cannot do better than that, ever. At an audition, you don't need to beat anyone else or even compare. Do your best, and if they want you, they will hire you. If not, they just wanted something else, but that in no way diminishes you. The point is, you must have done your best. If you compare yourself to others, you will always fall short. By contrast, no one can ever be as good as you are at being you. Lesson two, sing with intent. The importance of singing with intent is the fundamental difference between truly communicating your art and just going through the motions. One of the most valuable tools I use to teach this concept in singing is so obviously simple that most of us overlook it. It is the very act of speaking, or rather how we approach speaking. It is intuitive, it is innate, it is genuine. At its very least in singing, it's a shortcut. And at its most valuable, it is authenticity. Over and over, I tell my students to teach to think of pitch as inflection rather than musical intervals. In speech, this inflection enables us to interpret a single phrase in a wide variety of ways simply by means of raising or lowering the pitch at various points. This enables incredible subtlety of expression. We are not consciously aware of this. It is hardwired into our brains so that all we need to do is have an expressive intent. Inflection is what gives speech specific meaning. It's the emotion. When we speak, particularly here in the South, we use a dizzying array of pitches to illustrate a variety of meanings. And if you listen closely, you will find that these can be incredibly wide ranging, literally. For example, try saying the word what, as if you are in total disbelief of something. What? Y'all do that? What? Nope, <laughs> no takers. <laughs> So maybe if you're like me, your voice rose an octave or more, and you weren't even aware of it. No sensation of pitch change at all. That's very useful in the vocal studio. So if we think of pitch as inflection when we're singing, which is generally a composer's intent anyway, if he is sensitive to the text, several things happen. First, if we encounter a leap on a single syllable, we can have a real sense of physical connection in the vocal line, that much desired feeling of support. Thinking of inflecting rather than leaping usually eliminates any tendency to separate pitches. 
It helps to keep a sense of grounding of the tone, a sense of one sound with meaning rather than a bunch of notes to sing. I ask my students to think in terms of singing one tone that they just bend around. This type of inflecting reduces the sense of reaching for notes that span wide intervals. And this is related to another concept that I have totally embraced in the studio. There is no such thing as a high note. Yes, I actually tell my students this. I tell them that there are no high notes because the perception of high notes as such tends to create considerable problems. The fact is, a singer is either physiologically capable, based on his or her instrument, of producing higher frequency pitches or not. And in vocal production, there should be no real sense of up. What too often happens is the singer places too much value on the perceived high note, approaches it as something hard, tries to make the note happen, reaches for it, becomes tense, and therefore completes the self-fulfilling prophecy. That begins the cycle and reinforces the incorrect perception that high notes are hard. Instead, the singer should trust the instrument knowing that the pitches all emanate from the same physical location and that the brain tells the vocal folds, you may have heard them called vocal cords, the vocal folds, the brain tells them how fast to vibrate, which determines how high the pitch will be. High notes are written for musical and emotional impact, satisfying the need for passion and excitement. They are simply another way a composer inflects speech. With that knowledge, a singer is free to approach a musical line as communicative inflection. How would I say this? The intent of the thought will spontaneously direct the instrument, and physical changes should be imperceptible. There is no up or down in reality. Trust the abilities of the instrument, sing with communicative intent, and get out of the way. Our intent to communicate is perhaps the primary reason we sing. Sure, it is plain fun to produce different sounds, to play the instrument, but as singers, we are able to communicate through means unlike any other instrument, through the uniquely human use of the spoken word combined with music that can propel us emotionally to places beyond those words alone. You cannot just sing the words on the page. You cannot even sing what the words mean you must sing how the words make you feel. It is in this very intent to communicate that we can fulfill a higher purpose. We use our instruments to tell stories, to comfort, to entertain, to share. It is in that sense of purpose that gives our singing meaning, just as a sense of purpose gives meaning to our lives. Lesson three, singing is letting, not making. When my students make the greatest discoveries, it is when they trust. They trust their voices and they trust me. Even when I ask them to make strange sounds, they trust me when I say to ignore the voice cracking. They trust me when I say things like stop singing and just sing. Sometimes I even ask them to sing like they don't care. Because through all of the things we so often do to ensure that we are doing it right, we get in the way of our authentic voice. As I mentioned in the previous lesson, I have come to believe that good singing is much more closely related to speech than we understand. Every day, our vocal mechanisms are hooked up to our minds as we speak, and we maneuver through astoundingly, astounding and extraordinarily complex expressive interactions without conscious control. Try to imagine how cumbersome speaking would be if we consciously controlled our conversations. Our attention would be diverted from meaning and inflection to self-absorption. Conversation would grind to a halt. And this is what very often happens in singing without the singer even knowing it. Now before I go on, I do want to be clear now that singing well does take considerable physical effort but that is correctly placed in the core of the body rather than the muscles of the neck, tongue, or jaw. The neck, tongue, and jaw muscles are the ones usually associated with the false sense of control I'm talking about, where students tend to feel mistakenly that they can make things happen. Often it is the most conscientious students who have difficulty letting go while singing. In their desire to do well, they need to feel their effort as feedback proving that they are doing their best. 
that they are in control. What they actually feel is muscular tension wrongly perceived as control. Sometimes singing freely feels too easy and out of control. They actually say this. They sometimes think, how can I be doing something well if I don't feel like I'm working at it? And ironically, when something does work particularly well in a lesson, I'm asked, what did they, that feel like? And they say, nothing. Nothing. And that sensation of doing nothing to someone who wants to be certain they are doing a good job is scary. I have found this to be one of the most frequent and problematic aspects of teaching voice to help a genuinely motivated student embrace the fact that the sensation of having applied effort is actually counterproductive. Sometimes I'll ask a singer to mimic me or make a non-singing sound like a siren without thinking about it. And they do this with absolute freedom and a wonderful tone. These sounds are the same as singing sounds, just usually not sustained. And it is that idea of sustaining a tone, perceived as holding, that gets so many singers into trouble. Holding suggests control. Once I really get them to understand that sustaining a tone is not holding, but releasing, we begin to make progress. It can be quite a hurdle to accept that you are really in control of the voice when you might feel out of control. When the singer begins to trust this sensation, his potential is limited only by the physical parameters of the individual vocal instrument. He has at his disposal an ever-widening palette of options for vocal expression. The voice is capable of so much more than we can imagine when it is completely unencumbered. Sometimes, in trying to make sure we can control things for fear of what might happen, we actually limit ourselves from that very possibility. What might happen? We spend so much time making plans that we sometimes close ourselves off from wonderful things that our limited minds cannot imagine. Sometimes the best thing to do is to let go of our planning and control and trust in something bigger than ourselves and see what happens. Lesson four, you cannot judge yourself. What I actually say to my students is they cannot listen to themselves. Now on first hearing this concept for a singer sounds absurd. How can I not listen to myself? My voice is in my own head between my ears. But I'm not saying don't hear yourself. That cannot be helped. But rather don't listen and make physical adjustments based on how your own voice sounds to you. The simple reason is that you cannot hear your own voice from inside your head in the same way that it sounds to the rest of the world. If we could do this, everyone would be a wonderful singer and we would have no need for voice teachers. <laughs> this is why it is vitally important to have a teacher that you trust completely. He or she will be able to help you become familiar with how things feel when they are functioning properly, to be able to recognize that without relying on what amounts to false information. One must learn to separate the instrument from the self. There are many occasions when making vocal corrections based on one's own perception of sound can be detrimental. Trying to make beautiful sounds all the time based on how we hear ourselves can wreak havoc technically. Sometimes the best vocal sounds are simply not beautiful inside your head. This is often extremely difficult for people to believe, but it is crucial. In teaching certain transitions of the voice, I use the term the icky place, okay? a slender track where the voice functions easily and the tone is well produced, but inside the head it often sounds strident and even ugly to the student. I remember thinking myself when I was a young student, she can't possibly want me to make that sound. But the student must be encouraged to enjoy the sensation of the freely produced tone, to trust the sensation and not judge the sound. Contrastingly, another problem can arise when a singer enjoys listening to the sound of his or her own voice. Usually, the sound changes adversely for the audience. I can often tell when students are listening to themselves. Sometimes the intonation, the pitch suffers, and usually the tone takes on a distant, muffled, or veiled quality. 
when I ask them to stop listening and sing like you're saying something, the change is often dramatic. My ear is drawn to what instantaneously becomes what I describe as a more communicative sound. Imagine, again, if we spent our entire day listening and adjusting our speaking voices based on what we heard inside our heads. We would never communicate anything. Judging ourselves from our own perspective is fruitless, since in reality we cannot see, or in this case, hear ourselves as others do. Self-judgment and alterations based on that are detrimental to progress. What we want to be able to do as singers and as individuals is to function and communicate what we genuinely feel without the detrimental restrictions of self-consciousness. Lesson five, know where you are going, but be where you are. Singing is a delicate balance of thinking ahead while not physically anticipating what is coming. A singer must have an idea of where the phrase is headed in order to maintain momentum, energy, and communication to actually shape a musical phrase. In singing, this begins by taking each breath with the purposeful intent of singing the next phrase, never simply because there is a breath marked on the page or because Dr. Dacus said to breathe there or because the singer has simply run out of breath. One must think Think and breathe in the entire phrase, a single thought, as in speaking, allowing the intent to guide him through the completion of the thought. However, as one sings the phrase, the body cannot anticipate the end of any syllable or sound within that phrase. Technically, this is accomplished through a true legato, maintaining a pure vowel for the entire duration of a pitch, what I like to call open-ended vowels. The singer shapes the appropriate vowel and simply leaves the shape in place until it is time for the next shape. This is also what creates a beautiful singing line. The conscious act of a singer who allows the vowel to remain unchanged is what prevents the antagonistic struggle between the muscle shaping that vowel and those attempting to move in anticipation of some upcoming change, perhaps an N or an R at the end of a syllable. This leaving the vowel open-ended enables the singer to shape and enjoy each note at will in the context of the entire phrase. It, is also, it also allows the singer to sustain and then easily release a long high note, again, letting, not making. So many times I've heard, Dr. Dacus, I don't know how to get off of that note. This is often because the singer is anticipating, even subconsciously, having to end the note and not enjoying being in the moment of it. She subconsciously holds it in a controlled effort to prepare to let it go, <laughs> rather than simply singing through the tone until she wants it to end. Sing forward with intent until it is finished. This applies to all sustained note values, no matter the pitch. There must be a sense of forward momentum, even in very long note values, a sense of completing the thought. The tone must have adequate energy moving it forward. Often a student will simply sit on a note, maybe even counting beats, waiting for it to end. I just need to make it to the end of the measure. But is it immensely easier to sustain a very long note when there is a purpose for doing that, other than perfunctorily singing it as a prescribed note value? Nothing seems to make a long note longer than counting beats. It is important not to simply bide your time, but to create something worth hearing. Why are you sustaining that note for that specific word? What is the emotion expressed in the sustained tone? The optimum goal is to have a de definite dramatic or a poetic intent, a deliberate sense of movement through time while allowing full commitment to the tone being sung. This allows the freedom and joy to create music, new and alive at each moment. This is when the magic happens in singing, when we have momentum and emotional intent in the musical line, but are free enough at any given moment to allow it to bloom into whatever it might become. Know where you are headed, but enjoy where you are. Lesson six. It's not about you. This is one of the most complex issues singers must face because the vocal instrument by its very nature is part of the human being who possesses it. 
That is part of the complexity, the inability to literally separate the instrument from the self. Not making perfect sounds on your own voice feels like personal failure. And it is incredibly difficult to hear criticism of one's voice and not hear criticism of one's self. For a singer, the two are virtually inseparable. If, however, a singer can embrace this concept, the vocal instrument as an object separate from the self, like a horn or a violin, learning how to play it can be much more productive and potentially less emotionally exhausting. Without this separation, self-indulgence in various forms is a potential hazard for singers. And when I say various forms, I have found that there are many, and some of them you may find surprising. Sure, we are all familiar with the stereotypical image of the prima donna with her huge ego and vanity making life miserable for everyone around her. Where is my crystal goblet of tepid water? My bowl of chilled grapes? While this may sometimes be the case, it has been my experience that the most genuinely gifted and brilliant people are the most confident, gracious, and considerate of others rather than self-absorbed. But being self-absorbed can take many forms beyond the demanding prima donna. And now I'm going to confess something to you as an illustration. As a graduate student, I had the privilege of working with the magnificent soprano Martina Arroyo. I'll never forget singing Mahler's Ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen for her. Remember the last song I sang for you earlier, the one that is an anthem for singers and is also, by the way, one of my very favorite songs of all time? Well, I sang it with everything I had, only to hear her say, no, Viola, you cannot cry yourself. You must make them cry. Well, I was devastated. <laughs> How could it not have been right, I thought. I felt it so sincerely, and I love the feeling of feeling. Feeling is one of those things that draws me to poetry and music. But she was right. I was being self-indulgent, feeling for myself. But as I have chosen to be a performer, it is my job to bring those feelings to the audience, too. I have to be able to sing my best to do that, and I cannot sing my best if my throat is clenched from crying. Once more, that requires separating the self from the instrument. When a singer focuses on what is truly important in performing, offering a genuine interpretation of the music, sharing it without crossing that line, the preoccupation with the self falls away, the audience receives a more valuable and selfless gift and responds to the performer in an equally sincere manner. In addition, thinking beyond the self and focusing on the music, the poetry, the composer, it is a tremendously effective way to feel more comfortable in front of others on stage. Stage fright is fairly common. Singers wonder if they'll trip walking on stage or forget the words or if people will like them or if their dress looks okay or if their voice will crack. Or... The list of preoccupations can go on forever. And while these seem like innocent concerns compared to the prima donna's ego, for a singer who wants to be an artist, they are also detrimental forms of self-focus that can be remedied by refocusing on the real purpose of singing, sharing the music. Now, a minute ago, I said that self-indulgence in singers can take many forms and that some of them might surprise you. So here goes. One of the most pervasive forms of self-indulgence that I encounter is actually the antithesis of the prima donna. Many of my students have been taught that it is necessary to be acutely humble, and it is the acute part that is the problem. Please do not misunderstand me. Humility is certainly an admirable and even desirable quality. But when profoundly adhered to in the voice studio, it can itself cause undue focus on the individual. In a person learning to sing, the fear of appearing vain, ironically, can be just as self-indulgent a behavior as vanity itself. I've witnessed this, and sometimes to a nearly debilitating degree, in singers who constantly monitor and restrain themselves. Am I singing too loudly? Am I showing off? 
Do I sound like I'm trying to be something I'm not? Trying to teach a singer who is on some level afraid of being good at something is extremely frustrating. They may have a moment of success and get excited about it and then quickly disown it. It is essential for these singers to understand that the voice is a gift, not of their own creation. Again, separating the voice from the self, the instrument from the ego. To fail to develop a gift because of one's own self-deprecating attitude, even in the form of humility, diminishes the gift. There is nothing noble in self-deprecation. Humility is a virtue, but self-deprecation is not. By separating the gift of the instrument from the singer's personality, a voice can be developed to its full potential without fear of personal pride. Any sounds that you make with your own voice are yours, not of your doing, but of your gift. The ultimate act of self-indulgence would be to inhibit something that was given to you and has potential beyond your own imagination. Lesson seven, singing is balance. Singing is all about balance. Singers use the term appoggio from the Italian meaning to lean on to represent a much desired balance in breathing. I tell my students to relax when inhaling and to suspend the feeling of inhalation as you sing. When we attain appoggio, we have achieved a balance of breath pressure, that point where the inspiratory muscles and the expiratory muscles work together, allowing a free flow of air that, when combined with the appropriate resonance, allows for the optimum efficiency of vocal production. The feeling is a sense of perfectly energized ease, a sense that we could sustain a tone forever. This balance of properly engaged breath and resonance is perhaps the most important aspect of singing well. Without balance in singing, things fall out of place very quickly. If there is not enough energy in the breath, a singer may compensate for the lack of support by a false sense of support in the throat, which is actually tension. The vibrato may become wide or wobbly. Perhaps the pitch goes flat. There is no energy or vibrancy in the tone. By contrast, a forced overpressurized airflow may also cause the singer to become tense by attempting to slow the airflow by squeezing the throat. Additionally, in this process, by having overly tense the abdominals, he restricts the flexibility needed to shape phrases. The vibrato, again, may be affected, perhaps becoming too quick or bleaty. There is no flexibility or indeed ability to develop the tone or shape of phrase. Only through a balance of the muscles of support, breath energy, and resonance can we experience a truly free and useful vocal production. I talk often of the concept of singing from breath to resonance, or I ask them to sing as if they were going to speak the phrase, enabling them to bypass any sensation of the throat. When students accomplish this in a lesson, I ask them what it felt like, and the answer is almost always like nothing, effortless. When things are balanced, Nothing is conspicuous other than the free functioning of the instrument. We are aware only of the communication and ease of the voice. Lesson eight, singing is moving forward. Music by its very nature as a temporal art can only move forward. As we sing, in addition to the forward motion of time, we have the sense of forward motion in many areas. We are aware of the forward motion of the emotional intent of a line, of the breath, of one vowel moving into the next, giving us a sense of line and momentum in both the voice and the musical phrase. Adjustments through the vocal registers are often made much easier if the singer feels the tone move to a more forward placement, sometimes even outside the body. One of the most admired vocal accomplishments, a sustained decrescendo, getting gradually softer, is often misinterpreted by inexperienced singers as a pulling back of air. But a successful decrescendo can only be accomplished when the singer realizes that what is needed is the continued forward motion of the breath even as the tone continues to get softer. Finally, the concept of forward thought applies crucially in non-technical areas as well. So often a young singer will make one mistake and then proceed to pile up numerous additional blunders, 
because he is thinking about the first mistake he made. <laughs> when this happens, I tell my students that they have a, hit a tree looking in the rearview mirror at a pothole. Our art is one based on time. Things happen so quickly that we don't have time to dwell in the past without risking the future. Life, too, is a gift of time, and that time exists moving in only one direction. We may learn from the past, but must dwell in the preciously brief present, knowing that we are moving ever and solely forward. And the last lesson tonight, all music does not happen on stage. All worthwhile music is not made on stage. For many of us, the supreme goal is to have a career in which we can make music and share it with as many people as possible, and that is most often on a stage. But as musicians, often predisposed to sensitivity, we must be aware that profound musical experiences can happen away from the stage, in the studio, the practice room, or in rehearsal. I have wept in students' lessons when everything falls in place and they're making music. I have had moments in practice rooms washed in sensations of how far I could go with something vocally or emotionally. And I've had rehearsals I wish I could recreate on stage. But that is part of the mystery. It cannot necessarily be recreated. Authentic musical experiences are often elusive. Perhaps our most profound musical experiences happen in everyday life and often happen when the singer is purely engaged in an activity that only peripherally involves music, as children playing games, in the car singing with siblings, fully engaged in worship, or a mother trying to get her child to sleep, the things we remember for a lifetime. How are we drawn to music to begin with? Music is more than merely performing. It is a rich extension of the life experience, a part of what it means to be a sentient human being. Comparable to singing on stage is our current obsession with living in the perceived spotlight of Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. It has become common to broadcast every aspect of one's life onto the virtual stage. The danger becomes valuing one's own life events by the number of likes, follows, or comments. We must be aware of the preciousness and value of our own life experiences. Share them if you like, but treasure them simply for the riches they are. Beautiful moments of personal satisfaction, expression, and bliss happen whether anyone else knows about them or not and they are no less significant. You must decide what your idea of success is. If it is singing on stage at the Met, that's great, as long as that's what you want, and not because the world says that is success. You are not required to live by anyone else's standard of achievement. If you are doing what you want to do and are happy, that is the greatest success in the world and it doesn't necessarily require a stage. So in closing, I would like to restate our voice lessons from this evening. Each voice is unique. Sing with intent. Singing is letting, not making. You cannot judge yourself. Know where you're going, but be where you are. It's not about you. Singing is balance, singing is moving forward, and all music doesn't happen on stage. We are, as singers and as human beings, singular individuals. We are each given a unique instrument. Some are given that dime store ukulele, and others a Stradivarius, most of us something in between. But the type of instrument you get doesn't matter as much as what you do with it. Because some people have a really good time playing the ukulele. And having a Stradivarius means nothing if you don't know how to play it. Thank you. Thank you.
if you would join me down here for just a moment. We do want to thank all of y'all for coming tonight. And uh, that was an excellent uh, lecture, as well as the, we knew the vocal performance would be perfect. So, uh, because she looked like she enjoyed it. <laughs> I'm an ordained minister, so I'm sitting back there the whole time saying, that'll preach, that'll preach. So, uh, we want to present Dr. Dacus with the plaque. It's in Mississippi colors, a blue and gold. Um, and it says, in recognition of Dr. Viola Dacus, Associate Professor, Department of Music, 2021 Teacher Award, Mississippi Humanities Council, March 23rd, 2021. So join me in congratulating her. Okay? <laughs> If you will, stand for the benediction, and then you're welcome as family, and you come and uh, hug her neck, okay? <laughs> thank you. Father God, thank you for this wonderful evening of information and inspiration. Lord, thank you for making each of us an instrument, and help us to trust the instrument, Lord, to do what you designed it to do. Thank you for these life lessons that we heard tonight, Lord. And Father, may we live in the light of these wisdom words that we've heard in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You again for coming. God bless.